I'm on my way to meet with and interview Chris Booth, who not just makes amazing sculptures around the world, but has a profound connection with both nature and indigenous peoples that I wanted to explore more, so I'm looking forward. So somewhere up here is where a studio is, so I'll have to find that. I'd say I found the workshop. <laughs> cool. I feel like I should first say, for anybody listening, this is Chris Booth. Oh. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> um, so I feel really um, honored and, and grateful that you have made some time because I know that um, <laughs> you do some amazing work and I wanted to just explore sort of more about your work. And uh, I think a lot of your story is I found it really inspirational, so I thought uh, it would be fun to just probe a little bit about about your story and about your work and share that with people. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really thrilled that you're asking me, so um, I hope that whatever I say might be useful to other people, particularly the younger ones who, uh, yeah. who might be looking at thinking, could I be a land artist or an, an environmental artist? And, yeah. And uh, could I just launch into that part yeah. of it? Because um, I think that you know, there's always an alternative to going to art school. That um, I only spent a year and a half at art school, and then like, and I know with your sculptures, one of the things I loved is you having in mind that people might interact with them and maybe climb on them, and yeah. they're part of the environment. And yes. I think it's nice. Uh, you know, you said in uh, I think at your talk. In what other country can you, yeah. like, can oh. kids just go and, inter, you know, play and climb on sculptures? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that was a classic bit of footage that I got there, wasn't it? Yeah. The, I mean, that, that sculpture is six metres high. And as you saw, completely covered in children from that size to, to that size and just climbing up it. And even, I noticed that even the ones right at the very top were sort of reversing up and didn't you know it's just unbelievable yeah even actually i've never climbed up top of that yeah i when i was up there it was with scaffolding and everything but <laughs> there you but go it was just so exciting to see and you heard the pacifica music in the background yep it was just so special yeah and and with the rainbow warrior memorial you know that whenever when if there are children up there they're invariably climbing up the rainbow and some oh my of them, God, all the way up to the top? Yeah, some of them are brave enough to sit in the white <laughs> rings right at the top. Really? And my children, I brought them up to do that too. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh my God, I can't, because that was a beautiful, um, I, I, that was I think the first sculpture of yours that I saw. Tanya took us over there during lock, or maybe just after lockdown. And I was like, how do you do that? Like get the stones to like sit there like a rainbow <laughs> and then the, the fig, you know the eternity sign and yeah well it is a combination you know combining with steel you know it's a stone and I, it's a tensegrity structure which means tension and compression so all the tension is taken up by the the steel sometimes it's just cables or ro thin rods yeah um and uh and the stone which is the compression element of course it, yeah it, it, it means that can you know, I mean, as we know that those incredible cathedrals that, that go back so far, so many hundreds of years in Europe, um, it's unbelievable how they made stone fly in those days, isn't it? With no steel. But, um, well, they're 
I think they may have used it lead, but anyway, yeah. nothing, nothing like what we we can do today. Yep. So I, I, I'm nothing compared to what those guys did. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. After a year and a half at art school, I, I, I decided that I, I didn't want to have to sit exams about someone who's written about some great artist and just focusing on their words and nothing really, I mean, who, 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 how can their words be exactly what the uh, artist was thinking or why should I be sitting exams about what this writer has said and and uh, so I chose then to uh, to head somewhere in the in the in the world to uh, work to try to learn from a professional artist. I wanted to be a professional sculptor, and that was that. In fact, when I I left when I was 19, and when I was 19, I had this vision that that when I was 60, I was hoping that when I was 60, I would be able to be invited by different cultures to work with different cultures globally somewhere wow. in the world. And uh, and but in actual fact, it started to happen much earlier than that which was just incredible and uh, which was the, the best reward so in other words I think I must have been in my 40s when I was when I was starting to be invited by different or maybe even in my late 30s to uh, work with different cultures and uh, and uh, the, why, why would I want to work with different cultures it's just that um, you know New Zealand is a country that's been you know colonized and uh, by people from Europe and of course Māori came here maybe 800 to 1000 years ago from the Pacific um, but what happened what followed uh, European colonization was pretty disastrous on uh, on the culture of the Māori culture and it really really uh, compromised things for many many years um, and thankfully I'm part of a country and I think I've been part of the movement of of making an effort a real effort to try to uh, make things better than they were when I was a kid um, and so you know in 1975 I chose to well prior to that I was driving when I came back from Europe after having worked under the umbrella of Barbara Hepworth as a, as a student for, of hers um, and then in Italy with a couple of sculptors particularly Quinto Gamandi um, I came back to New Zealand and uh, and um, wonderfully I uh, um, I uh, got a job driving the school bus, which meant you know, early morning work and late afternoon work. The rest of the day was mine, and I was getting money for that. And wonderfully, also that the school bus took me to these little outlying Māori communities. And it wasn't as if that was anything new to me, because I'd been brought up in Kerikeri, which was a tiny little village, and it was roughly 50% Māori in those days and so we were just all brought up together at school and then when I went to college at Northland College in Kaikoui which is only half an hour away but I was put into a hostel and it was about 75% Māori and my teacher, my art teacher was Māori as well so I had a really good insight into into uh, as a Pākehā, you know, as a white person mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, but so I learned so much though when I was driving the school bus from the parents of these kids and from the kids to the point that I knew things weren't, that was just not right, you know, that there was really inequality in New Zealand and, and um, so in 1975 there was this incredible old woman called Finna Cooper who chose to lead a land march from the top of the North Island to Wellington to say that we must not sell one more acre or we must not lose one more acre to the, to the colonists was um, you know land had been just just been confiscated had been stolen had been everything trickery yeah. and all the whole works so I thought no nah, I'm gonna go up and join them and so I went way up there to the North Cape and joined up with the, with the folks and um, it was a huge honor to then follow them follow go with them all the way down to Wellington and it was a real insight into it because we stayed at Marae, like mm. meeting houses all the way down and uh, there was always huge uh, debate and it was, uh, of course it was in Te Reo and Māori language um, and I don't understand Māori language properly, I get an inkling of it but not completely to my discredit. Um, however, um, I learned enough from all my friends that I made to uh, to, to, to really get a really good 
picture of what was happening. And, uh, and so that made me want to work very closely with different cultures, particularly colonised cultures, to see whether, well, can I say it, that I would like to have been maybe a bridge builder? You know, I mean, it sounds arrogant to say that, and maybe a peacemaker, it sounds arrogant to say that, but bugger it. <laughs> I'd rather be that than than than, a, than an aggressor or a, yeah. or a, or a, you know taking on a dominant sort of no opposition um, and uh, and and wonderfully you know the, the the stories that I heard like the first place that I was invited to was Southwest Victoria in Australia working as the artist and resident at a university there. And uh, it was only a small community, um, but the, before I went there, I made an effort to find out the name of the Aboriginal elder and the name of the the people that the Aboriginal people that live there, um, and um, and made contact w w with the elder. And um, and when, I, when he came onto the university campus where the sculpture was to be built, it's the first time he'd ever been onto the campus, and he was in his seventies. And the stories that he told me, I've never cried so many tears in my life. It was just unbelievable. Um, you know, Australia's Aboriginal people have had it so seriously, seriously, terribly um, uh, in the in, yeah yeah challenged by by colonisation. And uh, nevertheless, the spirit is strong, and the and and uh, and even though things are by no means right there. Um, there are Aboriginal people doing great things to make their mark, to make sure that they're they're heard. And, uh, and that, I mean, I can't talk completely broadly like this. I have to leave that to them to talk. But but I'm just trying to give a bit of a picture to your audience yeah. uh, of my circumstances. And that 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 relationship with this elder, and then his family and his wider extended family. Um, and and the, what he taught me gave me a real insight into the to the land that I was working on, and uh, he, he would refer to it as the spirit of the land. I was getting connected to the spirit of the land through him and his family, and uh, from that it in, came through the inspiration to propose an idea. Now this is the way that I work globally: is that I won't just come up with an idea, make it, and stick it there. No way, that's just arrogance again. I, I would then I'd do a sketch and then take it to to the to the uh, elder and to whoever else he wanted to share it with and ask whether this is, you know, if this is okay what I'm proposing and also in regards to where the materials came from. Mm. Because, you know, um, land has just been stolen and, and in so many cases a place where there might be a quarry that I could purchase rock may well have been sacred land that was stolen from them. Yeah. So I always went, I have always gone through that effort, whether it be in Australia, Canada, USA, or um, in Europe, in Italy, or in in, uh, in UK. The old residents in, in Europe, you know, the people that have been there forever, um, who descend, you know, whose descendants, um, sorry, their yeah, descendants have, have, have been there forever. Um, uh, it, it's really, for me it's really important to share and make sure that to be as transparent as possible to make sure that that I'm I'm not doing anything that is going to do my very best to make sure I'm not doing anything to offend or or uh, simply to do something wrong and a uh, classic example was that big huge work I did in, in uh, the Netherlands at Krullamola Museum which was a huge honour to do it there they invited me because of the fact that I worked with, had worked with communities for many years up to that point. And uh, when I got there, I managed to find an old, old farmer, Bate Bronze, whose um, his ancestors go back forever in that particular area of the Netherlands, up in the Hoge Veluwe. And uh, and he, so he was part of the integral process of making the sculpture. And he was 96 at the time, and he would cycle up and join us for cups of tea and uh, see the process of the sculpture being built. And at the opening, it was just unbelievable. I mean, he, we, uh, I was had the honour of having um, representatives of Nati Ranana, who are the Nati London uh, Māori yeah. organisation, to come over and on that, on on 
on New Zealand's behalf um, do the proper thing about handing the sculpture over to the Dutch people. And uh, to see him, this 96-year-old Hong Ying, with, um, with the young uh, leader of our Ngāti Rānana group, you know, made me cry. It was just so special. Of course, he found it incredibly emotional as well. He couldn't speak a word of English, and we couldn't speak any. In fact, the Dutch couldn't even really understand him because his his <laughs> dialect was so strong. Um, and and he and because, as you know, in New Zealand, we whenever we do a quarter or like a talk, we follow it up with a um, with a waiata or song. Very beautiful um, Maori custom. So I chose that we do that over there too, and so he brought up the the uh, the local uh, um, retired retirement home choir, and they oh. came up and sang this 100-year-old song about the village called Otolo, which is where we were basically working. And so all these elderly folk sang in support of his speech. It was oh, how lovely. It, it was just awesome. Yeah. yeah. But back to Australia, his name was Ban. Uh, well, we called him Uncle Banjo, Banjo Clark, Gunda Chamaro, Kirai Wurong um, uh, tribe, if you like, that belonging to the two people. But he sadly passed away in the year 2000. Um, but his daughter is an artist, and, and I commissioned her to work with me on some projects in Australia. And, uh, and we're still very close, we're still in communication. And, uh, yeah, it's, so these long, long sort of relationships develop. You know, a lot of people say, you know, for instance, in New Zealand, if you're going into a, a, a marae, you're expected to take your shoes off. Um, and and in the gallery, for instance, in New Zealand, where there might be a very, very special um, sculpture or painting exhibition by usually a Māori artist, and they ask, please, would you mind taking your shoes off? I will be the first to take my shoes off to listen to whatever that, that they're they're asking you know don't take food in there don't yeah. take drink in there um so yeah i try to keep my ears open and my all my wits about me to make sure that i'm doing things as right as i possibly can and it's and some people say that you know like for instance in the early 20th century in the early 1900s picasso and others uh, were using you know, Polynesian art as an inspiration for their work, um, and uh, and that it's been said that artists can take whatever they want because artists are free. Just just take wherever you want to because that's what art is. I'm not like that. I can't do that. I have to find. I have to, as I've already explained, and I actually find that it's far more enriching. And who am I to compare it? But I am to be able to go into that depth with 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 whoever I'm. The, the, the privilege of working with these different communities to go into that great depth is just phenomenal I get told and shown and shared with so many things that perhaps no one else would normally get shown or shared with and, and certainly sharing a lot of tears often as yeah. well um, but certainly lots of laughs as well um, and uh, yeah so I think it's you know if, if I can pass it on to anyone who's listening to this that i um, that if one chooses to work in a similar way, that it is a really, really enriching way of being able to be an artist. And subsequently, one's inspiration almost seems to flow. And also, the gaining of the materials. Like, you might be in a place where there are no, there is no rock, maybe just shingle. Um, but, but by, um, but by um, going along this avenue, you learn where there might possibly be rock and and then it's almost like the spirit of the land is actually working with you in the end as well that you're actually led to places where this rock is that are just perfect for the sculpture um, and uh, of course again making sure that it's okay to use it and all that sort of stuff but uh, yeah that's sort of in a nutshell you know that's beautiful because I, I resonate with what you're saying on so many levels including that as a traveler who went from vacation travel to full-time travel it's the same thing like going into the depth of a culture and a land traveling is so much more enriching than when it's just vacation hitting the tourist sites yeah, yeah. and like the um, it's funny in also full-time traveling I've also connected much more deeply with intuition in my life 
than in vacation. So I, I love the parallel with you know your the the enriching of your artwork and your the sculpture and the land and all of that coming together. Yeah. Um, it's just beautiful. And I, I think I'm really curious about because you so you knew from a very young age what you wanted to do. Yeah, from about oh. 14 years old, yeah, I did my first sculpture, yeah. And mm. your, I think your family was quite supportive of the direction that you... Well, my father wasn't, but my mother was. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, so, because I think that's something inspirational for people. How did you deal with the resistance that you're, if, if there was resistance from your dad, like... Well, he didn't, he didn't force me to stop or anything. He didn't put his foot in the way and make it not work for me. He was still... Um, you know, he, he, he just accepted the fact that I was doing something that he wouldn't have done and would rather that I didn't do. But it was very good of him that he didn't actually try to bar me from right. doing anything. So, yeah, um, whereas mum was openly supporting me. I think she saw from the age of eight years old that I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> 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 so, uh, whereas my twin brother, John, is, you know, very, very intelligent and, and is a scientist, and my other brother's a scientist okay. too. Whereas I'm more of a, as you were saying, but intuitive sort of person. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, and then, I, I guess I was blown away when this idea that you would just decide to go off to England and, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, in America, everyone's sort of obsessed with money and a career that makes you lots of money and that's a big focus. And you at a young age just decided to go on a, on a boat and I think you sold a lot of your possessions to get the money for the ticket. Did you, did you have a plan? Like, or was it just sort of like, I'm, I, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I want to meet Barbara um, when I get to England yeah. and, and I don't know how it's going to happen, but it'll just happen. Like That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. that's exactly right. I didn't have a lot of possessions, by the way. I had a gramophone in an old, old Bradford van, and uh, what else was there? A surfboard. <laughs> and I sold those three, but it was enough to get me my ticket wow. on the ship to... Uh, One way, so you didn't have a plan to come no, back? We, no, you, you, <laughs> you, you, we had to, by law, get a return ah, ticket. okay, okay. But, um, but, yeah, it seems crazy that, that... I mean, things were much cheaper then. Yeah. Uh, although I suppose they were relative, right? But I did aim that I wanted to go to Italy as well and work with, and try to learn from get Kenta Gemandi as well, and all that did pan out. But no, I didn't have, and I've never had. I've always been driven by by the vision of of the of the yeah of the vision, which is. Um, a sculpture but it's more than that it's within right. with the community and the environment and all of that's all linked to it. I've always been driven by that and that to do my utmost best for that even if I end up losing and I have lost a hell of a lot of money over the years but Barbara Hepworth said you won't get anywhere unless you don't unless you gamble in other words if you need a tool just try to get the money somehow and buy that tool and get stuck into your art and that's what I've done all my life, and you know, my truck that you may have saw yes. there—that was the latest huge gamble. You know, put us way into debt, and uh, and we're still paying it off. But you know, I, I just had to do it. You, yeah. Otherwise, you just you might as just give up. Yeah. Um, and so, and somehow, you know, you, but I have stuck with my family land. This is really important that Dad did let us four boys inherit this land, and so. That was a huge, huge um, privilege to be able to do that. You know, and many people choose not to go back to their family land, or they don't have family land. Probably most people don't have family land they can go back to. But yeah, you know, I felt for, I feel really blessed that this has happened for me, mm. and um, so we can throw rocks around here and uh, and and not really have to worry. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's a huge, huge uh, privilege, but I feel very much for all those that can't, you know, have to find a workshop. But people do. I mean, as you know, there's old warehouses that you know, artists get to get young artists get together and they share the cost of some abandoned or almost yep. abandoned warehouse, and they eke out a, a living, and then slowly, you know, bit by bit, they make this the, the, the moves. Yeah. I, I've always said that to myself that um, when I'm when I was young that I would never turn down a, an opportunity particularly 
I had to make sure that that opportunity wasn't where I was going to get used, but where that, that opportunity was going to be a wise opportunity to, to, to take on. For instance, to be part of a, 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 a group exhibition or to have the, the opportunity of building something in an environmental art place. or um, and In fact, all my life, I mean, sometimes I've only ever been paid with a, an electric chainsaw or a, or a very minimal amount of money. But it's, it's been an opportunity that I've seen is so powerful from the fact that it's in an, within an environment that is unbelievably inspirational, working with communities that are just unbelievable. And, uh, and then, of course, hopefully the outcomes uh, yeah. uh, reflect all that. So uh, I think that to the other artists out, young artists out there, is that don't think that you have to just wait until there's enough money in that project to do it. Just go for it. If it looks like it's you all over and it smells of you and it, and it is you, go for it. You know. And uh, beautiful. If yeah. you end, like the Rainbow Warrior Memorial, I gave my time for two years on that. The French reparation funds paid the costs in the end. But I was having to borrow money to build it. But thankfully they paid off that $40,000 that it cost for all the crane and the machinery and the whatever. But I actually gave my time for two years to build that. And that was vital. Yeah. That helped put me on the planet as an environmental artist that has the ability to be able to build a full-scale sculpture. And that that, and that, that sculpture is, again, working and reflecting a sensitivity with the community and with the land. Yeah, that's and I and I love how you do work with the land. And uh, can you say a little bit more? I know we spoke briefly, and you you said, and I had asked you, um, looking at some of your sculptures, like the perfect spiral made with these huge uh, pieces of stone that you need your <laughs> truck to be able to lift, but they fit together perfectly. And I think you said that they they kind of tell you. Um, which they call, I don't know, what, what's your process of, of the intuitive connection to the, the pieces of stone or land that you choose for a given sculpture? Well, as I've already explained, I've explained it all the way through to the actual getting of the rocks, those, the intuitive things that happen there and the sensitivity that's required. Mm. Um, but then for the actual individual stones, um, yeah, it's, it's just like if you spoke to a, a dry stone waller, they know exactly when which is the right stone. There's a, there is a, I believe there's a spiritual connection. I mean, yeah. I believe that rocks are living things. And uh, even though I drill holes in them, I still do it with love. I mean, I get a lot of my rocks from quarries which where the rock is going to get crushed into road gravel or it's going to be dumped into road sidings or river conservation or whatever, which is... Um, but I try to rescue some of these rocks and, 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 and allow them to sing with my, with my poetry, if you like. Mm. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, so, yeah, I think these rocks, they, yeah, just like a dry stone wall, they, they, each rock will speak and uh, it says where, well, sometimes you make a mistake, oh, that one doesn't work <laughs> after all, but. Thank you so much for, um for tell, sharing your story and your process and um, you've, you've inspired me and I hope that you inspire a lot of other people listening so oh Heather I'm really I'm very grateful <laughs> that you've done this and I and I really hope that I have inspired some of your audience out there it's a uh, yeah go for it, go for it. <laughs> yeah and love love aroha love is the main thing the main driving force oh that's so funny I just <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. isn't it crazy? After millions of years, we're still trying to say, "Look, come on, just resort to love." You yeah. Know? All this bullshit about trying to that where people are just looking for anything else but love. Or yeah. They say that it's love, but it's just all money. Or yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But, love yeah. is meant so much, so much more profound than money. We yeah. still have. We're still trying to make the globe think that way but oh god let's hope it does soon. yeah Jeez. i hope so <laughs> okay thank you again thank you thank you <laughs> so that was a really special occasion uh, i feel really really blessed to have gotten time to spend with chris booth and i've 
seen a lot of his sculptures around New Zealand and I'm looking forward as I travel actually to see more of them because he has gifted the world with so many of his sculptures and I would recommend, I'm going to put his website here uh, so that you can take a look. Um, I'm actually going to use it to sort of try to, uh, in my future travels, kind of sort of connect to the spirit of his work around the world. So definitely take a look because his story is fascinating and his work is amazing and his connection to local peoples as he does his work and connecting and getting the permission and you, you heard a lot about how important uh, it is to him in his work to ask that permission, which I think relating to traveling, uh, you know, listen to also, you might want to listen again to connect a lot of the similarities that Chris was talking about with the experience of doing something that you love, uh, that you, you know, that you just go for it and that you kind of focus on the vision and let the details fill themselves in in their own time that you connect to the intuition and you choose the right paths and the right tools for you and you know that when you are fully passionate and inspired by something that you go do it so those are just a few of the themes I think that really stood out to me and I'm really grateful again to Chris thank you so much and Again, I'm going to put his website down below. So if you want more information about him, you should check that out. So thanks for listening.